I will call the Millville Finance Committee meeting to order on April 28th, 2022. Recording in progress. 7.32 p.m. Um, thanks everyone for joining. So primary purpose for today's meeting is to put, is to prepare and continue to plan for our annual town meeting, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, we have a number of guests on the line tonight. Um, based on our conversation from our last meeting, we uh, had discussed bringing in a few of the departments to just get an overview of their budgets and to the extent we have any questions asking them. So um, today on the line, we have Chief Coop, Chief Liard, and Pat Finn and Tina Cook from the Millville COA. Um, and then we, of course, have Peter Caruso, who is our town administrator, and Jennifer Gill, who is just joining us, the um, chairperson of the Board of Selectmen. So we have a packed house, and I appreciate everyone taking time to join us this evening. I think, you know, we can jump right in and maybe we go right to some of the budget discussions to um, be mindful of the time of those on the phone. Um, Chief Liard, I know you had some some things going on at home too. Did you want us did you want us to start with you so then you can you know you can go about what you need to do if that works for you. Well we're having trouble hearing you. No. Does say he's unmuted. Hmm. Maybe your microphone or something. Anything? Yes, you go. we got you. Thank you. All right. Um, so thanks. We can hear you now loud and clear. Um, I think, you know, for your department, um, being fire, I think we just wanted to kind of get an overview, being one of the larger departments, to understand um, your budget for this coming year. Specifically, I think the largest increases that we saw related to percentage increases anyway, were um, the increase to the EMT and firefighter part-time wages. Um, and then there were a few other uh, relatively significant increases from a percentage standpoint for repairs and maintenance, I believe. So maybe um, if you want to just kind of talk through your budget in general, and then specifically, if you could hit on that, um, the, the part-time wages specifically, and, you know, kind of what that entails and, and what that provides for you in the department, um, as well as the repairs and maintenance, and then we can just jump in if we have any specific questions. Okay, yeah, definitely, no problem. Um, so what I did try to do overall was follow the guidance of uh, that was set forth um, as far as with the, the salaries, just making the increases that needed to be made um, uh, with, the, with the wage increase and to take part, to take into a, uh, account um, uh, the 3% salary wages that Peter had put in the notes for us. Um, and I know there was the request to level fund the other line items in the operation budget. Um, and I did do that for the most part. There was a couple things that you guys alluded to that we did increase. Uh, so I guess we'll just start right with uh, uh, the kind of the biggest increase was the part-time uh, the the part uh, salary for covering uh, EMS, paid on call EMS shifts, uh, call firefighter pay and for responding back to the station for calls. And that also encounter and covered encompasses, excuse me, um, the pay for training for the call fire staff. So what I was doing the, doing that line item, I went on the, what was in the comment section and I just kind of added that stuff up that, that was put in the comments of the, the budget worksheet I had. And that's where the 93,000 came from. Um, but after doing some number crunching, uh, going back many years, that line item has been, has never been fully funded. Uh, that's taken in that again, that, that covers our call EMS staff for our, for pay for covering shifts. And for the calendar year to cover every vacant EMS shift that's not covered by 
the full-time staff, the the cost would be 95500 Again, that's just for EMS shifts. And that's if we're covering every shift. And we do try to cover every shift. Um, that doesn't always happen, the nature of things. Uh, but that is something we strive for. Um, and, you know, I understand budget budget's tight for everybody. Um, but that's that's one of the things, you know, we, as it stands now and as the budget's always stood, at least going back as far as I remember from getting, when I first got on the department, that's never been fully funded. Um, so even the increase that we add to the 93,000, you could see that that's not, if I can staff every EMS shift, that's not gonna cover it. We're still gonna be coming back to the town um, looking for more money. But like I said, we don't, we don't get 100% staffing. We just, just for the nature, people can't take shifts and it's just the way it works. The only way we're gonna get 100% coverage is uh, going by to either per diem staffing or full-time 24 seven coverage. So the, uh, the deputy to crunch some numbers and just to give you guys the in, some this info, and like I said, I know it's the budget's tight, and my job is to try to push for what I think we need to move forward and to to fund the department. Uh, but you know, I'm to serve you know with the pleasure of it's up be up to the townspeople and you know the the you the you you folks the financial experts. Um. So the kind of the number crunching we did, again, to cover all the EMS shifts, on-call EMS shifts would be 95,000. Um, to cover all the fire calls using last calendar year of 2021, with using today's, um, today's uh, pay rates for our call staff, we'd be looking at another 17,219 just to cover what we did last year for call uh, call fire coverage and call and call firefighter EMT training. Um, and also the, the 95,500 to cover every shift, that doesn't take into account if there are multiple calls on, on the shift. So that's, if there's a, if there are, Oh, uh, we'll say three calls for the fire for the firefighter or for the EMT that covers from their house. They get paid their seventy-five dollars for their shift, and that counts whether they have no calls or one call. And every additional call after that, they'll get an extra seventy-five dollars up to the the two extra calls. Um, if a firefighter or an, excuse me, an EMT is covering and staying at the station, they get a hundred dollars for the shift. And then for each call they get, they're getting an additional $25. So again, just, just want to make sure you guys have, have the numbers. Um, and I can, I can send this out to the, to the board. So you all, you have it as well. Um, but so that's kind of, I know it's a kind of a bigger increase, but like the goal is to not have to go to the town asking for more money. Um, I guess it is, you know, it's a, it's a crapshoot year after year, how many people we're going to actually get to cover the shifts, but we do stat, try to strive for hundred percent coverage. Um, and then the rest of the, the other side of that budget, again, with, uh, the call firefighters, we can't, there's no way to really gauge how busy we're going to be from quarter to quarter, let alone year to year. Um, so could you, I'm just trying to, um, I'm trying to recall exactly the increase to minimum wage piece of the $9,000 increase is, a, do you know approximately how much that is? That's just like increased to minimum wage based on prior year work. Uh, and it's okay if you don't have. Not, not off the top of my head. Okay. I'm just curious how much of that increase is based on because um, the note that we have here is increased to minimum wage and then the EMS shifts. Um, and I'm just wondering like how much of it is the wage increase versus the, um, the potential increase in, in shift coverage, but that's fine. Gotcha. 
does anyone else have any other questions? That was really helpful, Chief Liard. Does anyone else have any questions about that particular line item? No, Peter does. Uh, yeah, just to help make sure I understand what Roy's saying. He's he, in the budget. You've got ninety three thousand for this line item, right, Roy? Correct. But but your analysis that I think uh, Steve you're saying did suggest a hundred and twelve ish. I mean, you followed a last year's activity of the uh, events. Correct. Is what you're saying. So the only thing I would temper that by is if I look at sort of year to date, at least through March, um, you're tracking at 68 grand. If you annualize that, it, it's running at, I don't know, 91. So there's somewhere in between there, I guess, is reality that right. if you can live with the 93, which I'm not, I'm not hearing you're not living with the 93. I, I, in all honesty, I would be more comfortable with 95, but I mean, again, we're we try to do the best we can for the, for the taxpayers and, you know, be fiscally responsible as well to the taxpayers. So. Okay. Thank you, Roy. Okay. Yeah, that helps too. Okay. But again, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware because those that that ninety five thousand five hundred to cover EMS shifts. That's again the fully fund at least coverage for every shift. And, you know that that doesn't change from year to year, um, and that's been I think the number going back since the last increase to our call EMT pay of I want to say maybe three years ago, four years ago. If we changed that. Uh, and if no one's got anything else on that, I can move down to the the vehicle maintenance and repair. Where that one I in, had increased uh, from 20 to 30. And my main thinking there was, you know, the vehicles are another year older. Um, you know, it's anytime you get something that says fire on the side of it or any kind of public safety vehicle, it goes in for a repair. It seems like it's big money. Uh, and especially with engine engine two and truck 75, those are bigger vehicles. So, and the fact that we went for the reserve fund transfer, um, I thought it might be a good idea to try to bolster that budget, that line item a little bit more to hopefully not have to do that. Um, I not, I'm, I can't, they can't predict if we're going to have any major problems with the trucks like we did with that huge repair with truck 75 but with the age it's it's kind of a gamble where it could happen or it couldn't and we did have uh when truck 75 was out we did have uh engine two go out where we were left without a a an a, a engine in, in a capacity where luckily menden uh, stepped up and chief kessler helped us out with the loaner vehicle for a short time and the repair was made to engine two, but not, it was more of a Band-Aid for lack of a better word. And they had to order parts for it. Uh, the Band-Aid has, has been holding, but the parts haven't arrived yet either. So that'll be another expense where should the Band-Aid go and we need to make that repair. How much is just the annual maintenance assuming nothing major goes wrong, what do you track as just the typical maintenance on these vehicles, um, just from a yearly standpoint, approximately, if you know it? Um, I don't have that because it does, it does tend to, uh, I don't wanna say fluctuate, but it does tend to go up because we are, you know, it's there, the trucks go out there, the pumps get serviced, the, en the trucks, engines themselves, everything gets serviced, uh, they, the yearly inspections, um, the inspections to the aerial. Uh, one thing that's going to be coming up, I know, with engine two is going to be a uh, tire replacement. Uh, when that was in for its last inspection, they made note of that. They said, you know, it's probably next year, it's probably going to fail due to that. So that's something we're keeping an eye on as well. Um, but I don't have the, I don't have a good, a good number for that. Okay. 
Other questions on this line item from anyone? No, okay. And I think the other two line items that I did increase was, uh, let's see, going down um, admin and office supplies. I brought that up from six to a thousand. Um, only because in, in years past, I know when we'd run out of ink, that seems to be the big thing. We're constantly printing stuff up to post in the ambulance when there's changes to the protocols and the different uh, treatment options come out where try to keep a reminder for our staff and obviously posting stuff in the station uh, and print and training materials and stuff like that for our staff. Uh, and that in the past, what we would do is in the former administration, or I'm sorry, the former chief would be, you know, we tell him, and if it was a, that line item, he was kind of, I know he was using the police budget to get us ink out of that. So my thought, and I know that's getting kind of, that line item is getting low. So the thought was, well, let's bolster that a little bit. Cause like I said, inks, inks going up. The price of all office supplies is going up. Okay. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's a $400 increase, yeah. so it's relatively small numbers, even though the percentage is higher. And, and the last one I think I had was the uh, ambulance supplies. And that I, that kind of fluctuates year to year due to the types of calls we have. If we have a, uh, a cardiac arrest with CPR, for example, we're going to be utilizing the AED. So there's the AED, AED pads or um, oral airways are going to be used. It's just stuff like that that's going to need that needs to be replaced. It's really helpful. Does anyone have any specific questions for Chief Liard? No, no. Thanks for coming in again with some of these big budgets. It's just it's helpful to just talk through it. You know. So thank you. No, definitely. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, if we have anything that comes up in any of our further discussions, I'll certainly reach out, um, but I appreciate you taking the time and you're welcome to stay on or drop the, whatever you'd prefer. Great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Uh, reach out. If anyone has any questions, reach out at any time. Sounds Thanks, great. Steve. We sure will. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Take care. All right. Um, Chief Coop, do you mind talking with us next? Of course. Okay. Um, so same kind of thing. Again, just some of these larger budgets, we're looking to talk through them. I think the largest or perhaps the only, you know, substantial increase or change in dollars compared with prior year is the police patrol and officer salaries um, and looking through the budget unless Peter, something's changed since yesterday. I don't think any of the other increases were all that significant, but um, maybe if you wanna start there and just kind of walk through exactly what that entails and what that allows the department to achieve with that increase in, in budget, that would be helpful. And then um, if anyone has any questions, we can certainly ask you them after. Okay. So the hope of the increase uh, in, in the uh, full-time budget is a correlation mostly with uh, the introduction of a bridge academy for part-time offices. Uh, in the very near future, well, actually tonight, I actually have an officer who just got certified last Thursday, and he's leaving tonight after <laughs> it's his last shift. He was a part-timer last week, and after a three-month academy, he's now made a full-timer by Massachusetts law that was recently enacted. So uh, my hope, uh, amongst other reasons that Peter and I had spoken about, my hope was maybe we could do something more toward uh, uh, full-time positions since a part-timer is almost gonna be obsolete in our type of, because now they're gonna be able to go to these other departments. Uh, and, uh, it's not really a complex project. Basically, they only go to school for three months part-time. 
and they're given the same credit for what somebody currently goes six months full time, sun up to sundown. So the state brought this upon us and it's going to cause grief for small departments that rely on a part time uh, personnel. So Chief, if, uh, Aubrey, if I could help supplement what Chief's talking about. So Chief, would it be fair to say, <clears throat> so the Bridge Academy is the three month thing part-time versus the full-time academy, police academy to become a full-time officer. After the bridge and after so many hours of, of actual documented service of on-duty on service, uh, a Bridge Academy graduate who's been a part-timer can become a full-time police officer and the intent of the, what the police, I uh, forget what you call it, pilot thing or whatever it is, is uh, to convert part-timers into full-timers. And in essence, as you said, they're going to uh, become obsolete, the part-timers. And Millville's department has depended quite a bit on part-time officers. So the challenge is under the guidance, and you know, so we might have talked about this before, we thought that we're going to need to add a full-time police officer position in part to meet this challenge of the conversion of part-timers to full-timers. And at the same time, we also have some pressure, if you will, or impact of the uh, cannabis operation existing and the potential future one. So we're uh, trying to you know, proactively anticipate additional impact of, of those operations for which you know, the town receives revenue um, that goes into the general fund. So it's a sort of a two reasons for doing this. Um, the bigger challenge actually will become uh, actually filling these full-time positions. And that's the thing that, you know, both uh, Chief Coop and I had full heads of hair before we started talking about this. So uh, here we go. Uh, in fact, I think conceivably, if you, you look, he actually is one of the this year's full-time positions but he's now our acting chief so his full-time position of a patrol officer currently isn't being served he does do some shifts um but nonetheless he's the chief acting chief and um his the 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 spot on the roster of a full-time position is essentially vacant for him and there's also one other vacancy that hasn't been filled that's been budgeted so that's actually helped us to get through you know, the, uh, the the things we were talking about for special town meeting, we've been able to avoid those because we basically have a vacant full-time position not being charged to the town and helps us on the other challenges of the various line items uh, of the FY22 budget. How's that sound, Chief? Did I cover that okay? That, that does sound good. I mean, the, uh, something just a note I have two offices that work similar hours. The officer that's last shift is tonight. He's a big contributor. He is just under full-time hours here. Literally, he's a very big contributor. I have another officer in part-time that could be graduating from this program in as little as four months. So it is a concern to me. And, you know, I'm constantly watching it and trying to make sure I can stay ahead of this. Um, so I guess, why is it that on the police part-time, because I think of following, but why isn't it that on the police part-time line then we're seeing, a, why aren't we seeing a decrease if the intention is to move more to full-time and less to part-time? So like the, the police part-time line increases by 3% and then, we see, you know, the 22% increase in the police patrol and officer salaries. If I'm understanding correctly, it's the part-time is going to be more difficult to achieve based on these new requirements. So is it that we're moving more to full-time positions and such that the, we should see the part-time line item come down in time or, or am I missing something? We, we could see it come down in time, but I don't know right now. I'm still going to have seven, eight part-timers, and I'm even trying to hire some part-timers right now that could possibly work out short-term. The whole problem is it's an uncertainty of where we're going to be between a part-timer and a full-timer 
as the individual person realize the benefit they have just been granted by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to give them that full-time certification. I guess that's where it's gonna come down. Once everyone starts realizing the benefit they're getting, we could have an issue. And then we most certainly could look back at it at that point. And the other thing, Aubrey, if I could, um, I can't tell you what percentage of this additional full-time is, is related to the cannabis impact, but a fairly significant part of that is uh, part of the justification for it, okay? And I, you know, I think we need to be mindful of that. Um, and we see the revenues on the revenue side uh, benefiting the town. And, you know, frankly, there's, you know, a little pressure out there that's growing to wonder how one cannabis impact fees are being used in communities. So we have multiple public records requests for that and so forth that we have to address. We can't specifically say, you know, the, the money go the money that we receive goes into the general fund, but we do have impacts and additional costs that are administrative as well as public safety. And here, this position is one of those, uh, you know, results of uh, the impacts of cannabis operations. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you both. Does anyone have any other questions? No. Chief Coop, thank you so much. I mean, I just want to offer if someone wants to, you know, uh, if there's one liaison that wants to get the whole story from me, bring it back to your finance committee about what's going on with this bridge program and different things. Uh, you can reach out to me at any time. I'd be more than willing to meet up. I think it'd be easier for everyone to understand than me trying to spend hours going over yeah. it. The <laughs> yeah, and, and the chief and I sit down periodically, but he did think that it, it might be helpful to have one of the finance committee members and Jen on the board of selectmen and myself, the four, you know, four folks sitting in my office, just kind of talking a little bit further about the longer ramifications of the challenges he faces mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, uh, retention and recruitment of full time of police officers full time and otherwise, and and what we do about that, um, which of course inf influences uh, contract negotiations and so forth. Uh, we have one more year next year. FY twenty three is the last year of the contract. But I recommended to Chief Coop that, and the union guy that we start talking about that sooner than later in good faith to move forward and also, like, like, like I say, try to uh, reduce the retention and recruitment challenges a bit too. So, Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Well, thank you again, Chief Coop. And if any other questions arise based on our conversations, then I'll definitely reach out to you and um, appreciate your time spent with us tonight and your explanations. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. All right. Um, Pat and Tina, are you there? Can you hear me okay? I'm here. Hi. Is, is Tina there as well? Yeah. I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Laura. All right, thank you both for joining. Um, let me just shift to the COA portion of our budget here. And I think one of the reasons that we just wanted to talk with you tonight was um, we were seeing same, you know, same kind of thing. We were seeing some increases that were beyond the um, the guidance that we that Peter had issued on the initial budget. So we wanted to get some context there, and then I think we also wanted to just. Um, kind of utilities aside, because understanding that that those are increasing in, in a way that no one can control. Um, the two items that I think stood out to us was just the, the salaries um, percentage increase, and then also the van and the plans related to the old van and then the new van that we obtained, and then kind of like a long-term vision there, as I know we do have um, some increases in the repairs and maintenance line and, and things like that. So um, maybe if you just want to start there with some context and then to the extent we have questions, we'll certainly ask them. Sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'll start with the um, the salary lines. Only sure. because it's kind of hard to talk about your own salary, right, Tina? <laughs> but anyway, um, 
you know that the salaries of, of the whole budget is 50% of everything. Basically, those two lines, and that's the van drivers and the van coordinator, and then our director's salary. So this year, the COA has been working really hard and diligently on going over policies and procedures, job descriptions, and so forth. So can, we can really get a handle on um, what's happening, how everything is working, and so forth. So there'll be no questions in the future. But um, as far as the salaries are concerned, um, I know you don't want to talk about past history, so we won't do that. But I did want to ask Peter because um, we did we. Uh, reviewed some job descriptions with him and came to the same conclusion that what our director is doing is a director's job uh, versus outreach coordinator. And um, my question is, um, is our director an employee of Millville? Is she, a, is she a paid salaried employee of Millville? That's the first question to Peter. Well, she's an hourly rate person. Yep. But she's so employee much, of Millville. But yeah. she's an employee of Millville. And as such, um, I mean, shouldn't an employee of Millville be paid through the Millville's budget? So that's the question here. Um, I won't go back into past history. It looks like we're asking for a big increase. We're not. We followed guidance. However, um, she is making more than what the budget is paying her. So I... Without going talking about past history again, we're just trying to write the budget so that the town is paying for what our director makes per week for her 18 hours at the Millville Senior Center um, so that we won't have to use our, um, our yearly grant from the state, which is meant for other things, um, but which a great majority of that is, is being used to pay for the balance of what she's getting paid. And the same goes for the van drivers. Um, we're already, let me see, for the, well, for the director's salary, we um, have five more pay periods, I believe. And we're going to be short like $1,700. So we'll have to steal it again from that to formula grant. And for the drivers, we're already out of money. We've had such an increase in requests for rides, for medical appointments, for vaccinations, for picking up um, RX and all of that good stuff. Um, and then, then there's some grocery grocery runs too that more than one uh, senior at a time can request. But for doctor's appointments and so forth, it's basically a you know one over one type deal. Um, again, you've heard me say before, over 20% um, of our entire population in Millville are seniors. Of that, of that 20%, um, almost 50% are 70 years old or, or, or greater. So as you go into the 70s and the 80s and people are less likely to drive themselves to their medical appointments, um, they're calling for more rides. So we'll probably hit well over 500 requests this year, but we're already out of uh, the money that was allocated for the van drivers. So that's why the increase on those two salary lines. Okay, so if I'm just to make sure I understand completely, um, the the van. So let's start with the van. The van is based on ad hoc, like kind of ad hoc requests for usage of the van, which are paid out as they come in. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so you're saying the the demand for the van is higher than the amount that the town has allocated to pay the van drivers to do what is being requested by the senior population. Correct. Okay. And then for the um, the director, I'll, uh, you know, I'll just use, I have no problem with using that title. For the director position, the town of Millville approved a certain budget for a prior fiscal year. The COA determined that there was a need for the director to work more hours than was budgeted for, so has opted to pay those hours out of a grant. And so now the request is that we match the uh, that the town of Millville match the hours that the director is already being serve is already servicing the town plus an increase of three percent. Is that right? Pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Without going into the past history, where the budget actually didn't get reflected like three or four years ago, so we've been working in a negative. Um, and due to closings and COVID and everything else, when we got back to our 18 hours and she was being paid what she was offered to be paid for the 18 hours, it wasn't reflected in the budget. So we're constantly playing catch up. Okay. All, all we want to do is catch up so we don't ever have to do this again. We'd love to stick with guidance. We really would. 
Okay. I understand that. Um, does anyone else have any questions on just the salary portion? And then we'll second, we'll talk about the, the van and the plans for the old van and new van. Aubrey, I had a quick question if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, of course. So um, Pat, you mentioned that there's a grant that you're pulling from that shouldn't be used for this. So what are the parameters of that grant and what's the, like what's, what are you supposed to be using it for? Formula grant? Um, so Tina can probably uh, talk to that a little bit better, but from my own, my understanding, it's based on the number of seniors in each town. Um, so everybody is eligible to get it. So we're at the very lowest scale. The lowest number you can get is a $6,000 per year because of the number of, of people in the town and seniors. Um, it's not to be used for anything that is supposed to be funded by the town. Um, it's not to say that, you know, it, it doesn't say specifically salary and we've reached out to the uh, department of uh, uh well in boston um okay, and okay. They, thank you elderly affairs and they don't recommend that you use it for salary but they don't specifically say that it can't be it's supposed to be used for the seniors it's supposed to be used for programs and equipment and so forth um specifically for the seniors of the town um through the council on aging and at the senior center um, so right. what is but for the van driver, that's a service for the town. I mean, to me, it, it sort of makes sense that the almost the entirety of that grant could be used for the van driver's salary, just because that is something that's helping seniors in the town. You could look at it that way, or you could look at all of the seniors that don't take advantage of the van rides as well, and then they're missing out on that aspect of the grant. So, I think it was really used, it was really um, meant for the seniors um, to, um, you know, do things like perhaps um, uh, um, do fun things for the seniors, um, maybe have outings for the seniors, um, uh, do things like that that the town doesn't pay for um, rather than salaries. I don't believe it was initially intended for salaries for van drivers or the directors. So I have a question. What, what is the formula grant being used for currently? Currently it's being used because we have to pay the van drivers. So, or it's right now, um, it's used for exercise class to, re, um, to pay for the exercise classes, um, um, that sort of thing. So how much is being used now for the van drivers? It depends. The van. It depends on how how many um, rides that van driver has for that week. Um, the, it fluctuates depending on the rides that are out. Are you using the entirety of the grant every year? Um, we um, we it, in the past it was you use the uh, grant or you lose it um, or. or what would happen is if you didn't use the whole grant, it would be taken back by the state. Now the state has, has reversed that since COVID um, and that you can, you can carry over money if, if you have any money over, to carry over. We generally don't have any money to carry over, so. So what do you currently have now left? Um, I had, $14 left and I just received my um, grant money. So now I have $6,014. This is the grant money that we would start to use as of July 1st, but we are forced to start using it before this year has ended because we don't have any money left for the van drivers and we will run out of what's left on um, the director's budget line as well. So we'll have to pull from that. So again, we probably have used in the past at least 50% of that formula grant for these two line items. Yeah. So, so you've only used 50% of it. So you've used 3,000 to pay on the salaries is what you're saying, the van driver and the, and is it a director or is it a, an outreach coordinator? She's a director. Oh. Well, for the, um, for the budget, it's called outreach coordinator or something. Okay. But you've used, sorry, just to clarify what Claudia just asked, you've used 100% of it minus $14 and it just was replenished this week, right? Is right. That what you're saying? 
Okay. Well, yeah, um, two weeks ago, I think I was when it came in finally. So, so that's it for the year. So, so you had used for, for the for the year you used it all, right? Uh, yes. Fifty yeah. percent or so to the van drivers, and the other fifty percent or so, presumably for other things such as exercise classes or whatever you opted to use it for, right? Right. Okay. Was it used just for the van driver's salary or was it used for the outreach coordinator salary too? Um, right now it looks like it was used for the um, van drivers. Um, oh, we also bought a treadmill out of that account. So that's, <laughs> so that's, that's one of the fun things that we, we purchased was a, a treadmill for it. So yes, last year at the end of the same period last year, we were in the same position and had to use part of the money for uh, yeah. the directors or the outreach coordinator salary as well, because we were right. out of money again. So we're always playing catch up. It always right. runs out before the end of our fiscal year. Um, and we so need for the prior year. Can you so what is what are the seniors lacking from from using that money towards the van and the outreach coordinator's salary? Like, what are they going without? Plans for doing all kinds of things, anything from, and I, I mean, it depends on what, we can't plan to do anything with money that we don't have. So we're just basically paying our bills. Yeah, so I'm looking, I'm looking at the budget here and um, my budget that I have. And um, last year, um, we, we, carried over $2,000 um, in the formula grant money um, for me to use from um, 617.21 to 1230.21. Um, uh, and then I got down to uh, the $14. So um, that's, that's where we're, you know, so we're always borrowing against it for the, to pay um, salaries and stuff. Any other questions on salaries? Okay. Okay, can we um, discuss the vans next? in the plan for the old van and new van? So we don't have the new van yet. Um, we we're applying for the loan. We we're applying for, not a loan, sorry, a grant. So we, um, the, the grant application is opening up tomorrow. Um, so we'll be putting in our application. Now, mind you, there's no guarantee that we're gonna get this grant because there's, I don't know how many towns in the state of Massachusetts that are also applying for the, these um, grants. Um, so um, with that said, being said, we have the old van that we're currently, um, that we're currently using. Um, this year alone, 7121 to 428, um, we've had over 450 um, rides that we've, we've um, given out for the seniors. Um, right now, um, if we're looking at just keeping that $500, um, that $500 budget that you want us to keep, I guess, <laughs> or we're, we're saying we want to increase it to the $2,500. Um, the reason being is, we need um, four new tires for our van, for our old van, um, at, at the cost of $950. So right now, if we kept the $500 that um, we had last year, we're already over on that. Um, and then again, too, we have an inspection that comes up and uh, oil changes that come up. So, um, so already, we're, we've got $1,100 that we've expended out. So, um, and then we also have in the van, we have leaky windows that need to be looked at as to why they are, and that'll have to be repaired. 
So this old van, which we currently have, and we will have um, all of next year as well, um, we have to maintain it. So um, it, yeah, it's budget. a costly, it's costly, you know, so. Our budget um, is already in the, in the negative on this one anyway, because of the um, all the repairs to the van lift and the rear brakes and the tailpipe um, that we did not expect. Again, we don't, you know, it's a, uh, it's a 2014, nine years, it'll be nine years old next year. Um, probably only about 35, 36,000 miles on it, but which is not a lot, but um, Tina and I both attended the zoom meeting for the training on this, um, this uh, application process with the mass DOT. And one of the things they were saying is the two big criteria they look at, they look at mileage and then they look at, at um, the age of the van and anything over six years or a hundred thousand miles is what their criteria is. So we definitely hit the, the um, age criteria, the miles, not so much because we're a tiny town, you know, as far as we go, um, if we go to Worcester occasionally or to Providence, um, mainly we go to the local say 10 towns in this area. So low mileage, but old van. So with every year, everything is more expensive, as Tina said, right. four new tires, because this is a six tire van, four in the back and two in the front. Um, the new one that we are uh, proposing with, uh, together for our state grant is a, a four wheel, a, a Dodge Grand Caravan type A. Um, the, the passengers will be less, um, but also the cost to, uh, to drive it will be less. Uh, the gas mileage, 21 miles per gallon versus 13 miles per gallon, which we're getting right now, which hurts, <laughs> especially with the, the the price of gas. So um, we did, I mean, we did, a, we did a presentation to the Board of Selectmen on this as well. And we, we put a um, gas analysis together as well, not knowing how much it's going to cost, but knowing definitely that parts are going up, repairs are going up, the van is getting older. Um, trying to get something to cover it so that we can at least maintain it to see what happens. And as Tina said, we really have, uh, there's no guarantee that we will be one of the towns that will get it because we do have a van. So we can, we can just make the, the case as best as we can um, for an aged van and uh, an aging population, you know, and, and an increase in ride requests. Yeah, and for some reason, um, my timeline was crossed before we had this conversation. So that Van Warren article was from the special town meeting, right? Not annual town meeting. And so yes. that's right. I was thinking yes. for some reason we already had the new van. Um, yeah. that, that's why I was confused. So that $10,000. <laughs> yeah, right. I know that $10,000 that we had discussed as part of the special town meeting needing to to provide that for it to be part of the application was that completed through ARPA funds. So we have, so we, so as a part of the application process, you can still, you know, support that we have, this town has supported $10,000 of the potentially 50,000 ish, right. For the new right. van. Okay. Right. Good. Exactly. Got it. If we don't get it, then those funds are still there. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Helpful. Um, does anyone have other questions? I guess what what would be the plan to the extent, well, we can cross this bridge when we get there probably, we're just thinking out loud, right. um, to the extent we get the new van, you know, I presume at that point we would stop using the old van, right? We're not gonna maintain two vehicles. Well, that's a town asset and that would be up to the board of selectmen as we told them. So I don't know what's going to happen next year. We may have a thousand ride demand. I don't know, but then we will bring that to the board of selectmen and, and present the case with whatever it is, but that's not our decision to make. All we can do is give you where we are at that time. Should we have the new van and uh, give you all our statistics, how many rides and where they're going, what the shape of the van is in. I mean, we've already gone to Kelly blue book as far as, <laughs> as far as we could with the old one, you know, what it's going to look like in another year and a half. I don't know, <laughs> but, but yeah, definitely okay, I, more expensive. I can tell you what's going to happen to the old van because we voted on this at the board of selectmen actually. So we said that the old van needed to be put up for sale within three months of acquiring the new van, because if part of the justification and one of the benefits of the new van is reduced maintenance costs. So we keep the old van, then we won't be reducing maintenance costs. Well, that's okay. what we planned on. All right, hopeful. Um, 
Does anyone have any other questions related to, I guess, any of the items on the COE budget um, or anything they want to ask at this point of Tina or Pat? Well, I did have one more comment um, before sure. we go on. Um, something did come up recently. Um, and as I was talking about procedures and policies and all of that, um, last year we had a new generator installed at the senior center through a grant that was um, um, gained by a past employee. And as part of our uh, review of policies and procedures and so forth, we took a look at this generator and said, hey, does anybody know how it works? What we're supposed to be doing with it? Does it need testing? What does it, what does it um, uh, run if we run out of power and so forth as part of this whole uh, you know, emergency management thing? And um, so we called in uh, the person that had installed it and he went through it with us with the, with the COA and we put together our directions on how it's supposed to be used and what all the switches are for and what the lights mean and so forth. But he also told us that because it's, um, it's brand new that it has to be, uh, in order to keep up its warranty, it has to be maintained and it has to have service every six months. So the first service is due now. He did tell us that, um, let me see. And that was uh, Jack Gringo from Precision Electric. And I guess he does the service on our other generators in the town because I've talked to him again recently. Um, it costs $325 every six months to have it, uh, I don't know, drained and filled and maintained or whatever. So there's going to be a bill coming up, which I understand is now going to be the senior center's um, part of our budget. It's not in our budget for last year or that, you know, the last two months of this year. So it needs to be covered somewhere. And then for next year, it's going to require another 650 somewhere. So we did not know. I'm just bringing that up because it has to be covered somewhere if we want to maintain um, the warranty on this generator. It's, yeah. It, it, these are the kind of things that have to be understood when we come to get funding to put these things in. And we talk about this is exactly the point that we bring up in terms of it's not just the initial initial purchase price, what's going to be the operating expenses with an additional piece of equipment ongoing. And this is I'm not saying it's not necessary. I don't know what the requirements are for warranty maintenance on a generator on a um, public building. So I'm assuming that's correct, but it's just, um, it's really frustrating to have these things come up after the fact after we've bought them. And oh, by the way, it's $700 a year for this, you know, sorry, for the editorializing, but these are the kind of things that we try to push to get to before making decisions on capital expenditures and others. Yeah, you're not getting an argument out of us because we had no idea until we until we decided we wanted to know about this generator that's hooked up outside of the uh, senior center and how it works and who's supposed to do what with it and what the light means. So, I mean, I've got directions on it now, but I also found out about this warranty. So, I mean, something needs to be done with it. So I have a question about that. So Jack Granger, he said that you have to maintain it twice a year. If you want to maintain the warranty on it, yes. Really? That's for the first two years. And after that, let me see. It's required every six months. Um, and then let me see. He'll send an email notification when it's time for service. And then after the first two years, there's a whole nother service contract, apparently, that will be sent and the town can decide. Okay, here it is. For Let me see. The warranty it currently has a five-year limited warranty. Years one and two, it's all parts and labor. Year three, it's parts only. Year four and five, it's full coverage on machine components, engine, and alternator. And then there's extended warranties available for seven to 10 years, which costs approximately $1,000 for the term of the warranty. We can get a quote on these to see how or if the town wants to proceed. I mean, this is all news to us. I mean, we... Do you have it in an email? I'm sorry. No, yeah. I, I don't have it in an email. I asked him to send us something, um, but I don't have that. What I have is the directions that I wrote down while he was going through it with the COA um, about a month ago. Okay. While we were putting together these processes. What kind of a generator is that? Generac. A Generac? Mm -hmm. Okay. 100 amp. I can tell you that. <laughs> how old is the generator over at the... I never over... heard twice a year that you have to, you would have to do that. I, I know once a year. I'm going to call Jack. I know Jack. <clears throat> yeah, I just talked to him last week too, because I yeah, wanted yeah. to, um, I had heard that I had written down, I don't know, like $500 per visit and it wasn't, it's 325 So 
I just wanted to clarify, clarify that and get my notes straight for the and cost of this. You needed to do that twice a year. Yeah, in yeah. order to maintain the warranty, yes. Okay. Work your that magic be, on it. Huh? Work your magic. That would be <laughs> like- Get something in writing. <laughs> when did we- um, Maybe one feet. I don't know. Here, or maybe, Chief, you know this. Did we put a new generator at the police station a couple of years That's ago? That's correct. Is that correct? So is it, is it a similar situation over there, Chief? It is. I mean, okay. I, I just think of it like uh, we bring our vehicles in for an oil change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and he also did tell me he's making sure that nothing's going to start living in the enclosure and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an inspection. He cleans it up. Uh, so was, I was a little shocked by it too, but then I thought about it. it's nothing more than really bringing your car for service. Mm -hmm. It would yeah, be like it's, the It's HVAC. a fair question whether you have to do it twice a year. I think Town Hall, he does it once a year and it's 300 mm -hmm. and something bucks. So I did add a thousand bucks, as you know, to that uh, repair and maintenance line item of equipment for COA. Um, operating on the two five hundred dollar years, and or even at seven hundred bucks a year, there's going to be fuel. There's going to be who knows what else, parts and stuff. So this this new budget you have in front of you has an extra thousand bucks there. Great. I just brought it up because I, we didn't want any surprises, and you know, <laughs> like when the when the van broke down last year. I mean, this past year. I mean, it was unexpected. I guess maybe we can expect that something gets older. It you know, it needs more more work, but we have no idea how much. So um, that's my only reason for bringing that up. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Okay. All right, thank you. Pat and Tina, and if we have other questions that come up, we'll reach out for sure, but I appreciate all the explanations. All right. Thank you. Good Thank night. you both. Good night. Good night. All right. Um, so I think, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the only other department we had discussed last time potentially meeting with was highway. Um, I did reach out I included highway in my past few communications. I did not hear back from Brian. Um, Peter, I wanted to ask you because I know you had sent me a note that Brian had sent in some budget information. It looked like the budget that I have though is based on the one that you prepared for highway. Is that is that right? That's correct. So he, okay. he, he did not send in FY23 budget information. He did, right. you know, a couple of weeks ago, send me something, but it was FY22. Um, that said, he and I talked about the way I did the budget, which is basically, you know, 3% increases on the pay rates. Um, I added 4000 to for his salary line, taking it out of uh, grass cutting at MES, basically, because they are now doing the, the grass uh, maintenance up there. And he was good with that. And I level funded the rest of it, basically. And he was okay. seemed okay, at least in our conversation about that. Okay. I think That's he's been busy and hard to hard to connect with lately. So. Okay. Um. Sorry, I'm just looking at his budget. Then one more time here. It includes. So the highway other regular salaries increase of what we're looking at to be about ten percent. What what is that derived from? As an increase above and beyond the guidance. Again, I moved four grand into that line item, taking it out of the uh, uh, MES grounds maintenance because they're doing the grounds maintenance. Highways doing the grounds maintenance. I see. And we- So uh, not just a no. matter of funding, but a matter of the expense as well, the expense that, is there. That's right. So we just transferred the four over to cover it. So I you'll see. see four grand reduction in MES landscaping, okay? And I moved it to the salary line um, with the 3% increase. Gotcha. So that's where you got that, yep. Okay. And everything else and is the same. Likewise, uh, as I talked to him, I didn't change street sweeping, storm water, um, nor, um, you know, tree maintenance, tree warden stuff. Okay. 
Okay. Fair enough then. Um, and then I know we talked earlier today, but the um, snow and ice number, we don't have a final, but we're thinking it's going to be about 120K deficit. Is that right? Yeah, it's heading in that direction. It's over 110 from last I saw. And there was something that just went through one of the uh, recent warrants for it. So I think we're probably at the final stage unless Mother Nature does something really screwy. Okay. All right. Um, so just to give high level then, oh, and then, so then let's just hit on some of the other changes, Peter, from last time. Um, as I understand it, BMR, we had sort of agreed on the OPEB number at the joint meeting. We thought we agreed. We had an additional, we had a $200,000 total amount that we were considering as the OPEB con contribution to BMR. Um, it sounds like Blackstone has since gone back to their initial number of um, a total of 100,000, 100, so 75,000 of that would be Blackstone, 25,000 of that would be Millville. Um, so we have to align with them on this OPEB number because it's part of the BMR number that we have to agree, both towns have to agree on it, right? So. Um, there's been a decrease to our OPEB contribution on this latest budget from, I guess, the was last it initially? One you looked at, that's correct. Yeah, from yeah, the last, the last one, one I looked at to 20, it's currently 25,000. That's what we expect that will stay in yeah, the last 24 and a half, you know, 24 and change. Um, so that's right. So the last budget you had was at about 10,000 surplus. This one's at 9,300. So the high level changes are just that, one, that's one piece as you described it but separately getting the most recent information I could get from both Tri-Valley and, uh, you know, um, you know Norfolk, Norfolk County. Aggie, I had to add one additional um, tuition to Norfolk Aggie and that's 24 and change as well. So they basically offset each other, those two changes. Okay. And then not much else, right? Not much else. Yeah, just that thousand well. bucks on the Council on Aging for the generator. Okay. All right. So as Peter mentioned, our total is a surplus of $9,300, um, which brings our budget article pretty clean because we're not relying on any kind of stabilization or free cash monies to balance, right? Um, does anyone, I, want, I do want to go through the warrant, like run through it quickly with you all. Um, we have our public hearing set for Wednesday of next week, May 4th. Um, does anyone have anything specific related to the budget that they would like to discuss at this point or any other, you know, information gathering that we need to do prior to our public hearing next week? No. Okay. I want to say something just really quick because I think, um, like, I'm, I don't have anything about the budget or anything. I'm just really proud of us <laughs> because I think we were worried about where we're going to need to get money, we can't balance the budget, things like that. And then here we have a surplus. Now it's not a lot, like I'm not going to, you know, we can't go out and buy anything crazy or, you know, do anything big, but like we have a balanced budget with a teeny tiny surplus. And I think that, I don't know if a lot of people thought that we could do that. And I'm really proud of this committee, especially doing such a great job and Peter as well, making sure that, you know, we kind of tighten belt buckles and things like that. So. I just wanted to say like, awesome job. This is amazing. Yeah, no, thank you to, you know, Peter, I feel like, you know, your contributions to the budget process having been involved for the past many years at this point um, has been just like night and day and truly appreciate, <laughs> truly well, I appreciate think, you know, it. I think it's just, it, it's a reflection of all, all the department heads because they basically do follow guidance for the most part yeah. and when, they need to go beyond guidance. They're, they're able to because they justify what those needs are. So um, I think really yeah. you can't do it without folks trying to toe the line. So I think everybody's sensitive uh, to the challenges. For sure, yeah. Maybe I'll um, send a note to the department heads as well with that message because that's definitely true. It definitely takes a group effort on it. The other thing I would just caution us all is I think that the ARPA funds have helped us a lot cover many different expenses. And so I think we've been really, um, we've been really diligent about not using them for operating expenses, which is really important because we, you know, 
it doesn't necessarily impact the budget, but it, it definitely helps. So I think as we go forward, we have to just consider that as, you know, it was a little cushion this year, not to take away any of the hard work we've done, but, you know, going forward, that's some additional pressure that we'll probably feel. Um, but in capital planning too has been huge in helping us get a foot. So thanks to all. Um, I guess with that said, <laughs> the thing that continues to disappoint me is the free cash progress. And so it sounds like we're close. You know, every time we talk, we're close. Um, last email I saw is that it was going to be submitted potentially Saturday, which would hopefully get us a free cash number um, certified prior to our town meeting. I don't know if it would happen prior to our um, hearing, which I'm not exactly sure, you know, how, how that's going to work because we need to recommend things to the town. And if it's after our hearing that we get the certified number, I, I, you know, I don't know how we do that, but um, obviously the ideal and by ideal, I mean, like, I feel like the minimum scenario is that we have our free cash certified prior to our annual town meeting. And then the, the you know, this would be kind of two consecutive years where we're in a bad spot if, if we don't. So, um, so on that, Aubrey, Peter and I have talked a lot about that and we've met been meeting with the treasurer and the town accountant regularly. And one of the things that I kind of expressed frustration is like, we know when all these meetings are, like I can tell you when the town meeting is gonna be in 2023, but we're always still kind of like trying to figure things out. So I'm gonna work with Peter on Monday and put together like a calendar of things. So like we get an update from the public safety on spend, like the second town meeting in October, as an example, against part-time salaries and against maintenance. Like how are we trending towards these numbers? And to kind of just get like better checks and balances and maybe we do, you know, I know you talked many times, Aubrey, about meeting quarterly. And I think we've done it like once a year with the board of selection, but maybe like put on the calendar now, we're going to meet with finance committee in September and like January and like, just get a little bit better organized. So I take responsibility for uh, that. And so I think once we can kind of get a little bit more organized, like some of these things like free cash, because that's one of the things too, um, Peter and I talked about maybe getting the model out a little sooner to department heads. So we can, you know, just be a little bit better organized and things like that. So, but I also okay. share your frustration on free cash and the reconciliation and things like that. So, and Peter and I, like, that's like, hey, what if we didn't just put together a calendar and, you know, make sure we're meeting yeah. with the town account and town treasurer quarterly, be like, hey, you know, we want this for May 10th or whatever it is, 2023. Are you starting to look at it now in November? Because we were kind of close last year. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, keep us posted. Certainly leading up to our public hearing on Wednesday, we'll need to understand um, maybe if we have a tentative number that's that's been submitted for certification, we can provide like, you know, recommendations based on that. We do like to know what capital is considering from a free cash um, deposits into the various stabilization accounts. Usually we follow that lead. So, so again, timing is just going to be tough. So we'll have to work together once we actually have appreciation of what a number might look like. Yeah. So we have as caps uh, now as capital, uh, we obviously don't know a number. We've, right. you see that we've recommended transferring to the extent there's available funds to do that into those very stabilization funds. So we don't know that. We also don't yeah. know if we have free cash available for snow and ice. Okay. Further to that, I'll say, I wonder if we if we don't have that for some horrible reason, right, that we don't have free cash known, certified at the time of town meeting, must we fund snow and ice at that time? I, that's a fair question, so I'm going to check with council. I mean, these are thoughts that come to me sometimes, so. Yeah, no, I was going to ask that you do that as well. Um, I researched this several years ago now, and I, I feel like there's a process to pull it off of the, I don't even want to say what I think it is, but um, yeah. if you could look into it, yeah. Gary probably knows, but he doesn't want to say too, because he's not 100% sure. <laughs> um, okay, that would be great. Um, so let's just then go through quickly um, the warrant itself. Um, I think article one, self-explanatory monetary increases. Article two, the bills for the prior fiscal year, are these the same bills we were talking about at special town meeting? Yes, and these are okay. all we know at this stage. Okay. So they carry forward. All right, so um, 
all if you don't have the warrant in front of you, it's 6965 for assessor software license, and then $898 for CMR PC planning board services. And ideally that comes from free cash to the extent available. Um, snow and ice. So again, we'll get a final number. Um, Peter, if you could help us obtain a final number prior yep. to Wednesday, that would be good. Yep. Um, yep. And then also whether or not it must be funded now if we don't have free cash available, but it was looking like around 120,000. Highway Department Chapter 90 is a just general, that's, uh, I don't think we have to discuss that. Same with cable licensing fees. Um, that's a standard one that we always have. The budget we've discussed. Um, purchase of St. Augustine's church property. Obviously, this one is an added one, right? Um, since the since we've last spoken. Um, it, it sounds like there's no fine, uh, like well, thoughts on whether or not this is a financial article that needs to be weighed in by the finance committee. Um, Peter and Jen. Well, well, there'll be an amount in the motion, perhaps. Um, I think what, what the issue is. Um, we don't have the amount yet. <laughs> so if we don't know that by town meeting, then we're going to need to pull that back. Um, so, so yeah, but Jen, I would also say capital, it's, it's two parts. It's one, does the town want to go in this direction? Yeah. Because it's blocked from going in, in a direction of repair of old town hall, for an example. That's one of the things capital's looking at very hard. Our building department's looking, you know, is looking at very hard. We're trying to figure that out. It, it's doubtful that we'll know in time for town meeting. The St. Augustine um, opportunity, it, it may be fleeting. I don't, I doubt that, I don't know how fleeting it is, but it did come up. That's why we put this on there. This is the proper wording if we were definitive in knowing that we wanted to move forward and we had a number. Um, but, and we have a, you know, an executive session at the beginning of the, selectmen's meeting on monday night after which later in the meeting they're going to vote you know uh, recommend or not recommend various things in the end result of that may be to take no action on this one if if, if i think that's where we're at okay so then is it i mean this one might just be one that we would need feedback from the two of you at our at our public hearing on what this entails specifically and then we'll just have to right. discuss and and do what we do what we can or think we should do at the public hearing at the point of the public hearing maybe it's nothing anyone have any questions about this one okay Obviously, this is a new potential prospect to um, replace Town Hall based on a property that's just become available in town, um, St. Augustine's. Okie doke. So the next, so Article 8, mm. Article 9, Article 10, those are our stabilization articles. Um, we always want to put the vast majority of our free cash into our stabilization funds. So to the extent it's available, we'll discuss at our public hearing, you know, um, how we might want to uh, divide that, I guess. Is capital, capital is not meeting before next week, right? Are nope. they, Peter, or, okay, John, no, okay. No, okay. they're not meeting, nope. Has capital discussed anything by way of, so we, so we can kind of, um, I think we we thought we were following your lead in terms of the amount on this one. Okay. But we support doing it, you know. So so we did. So the the capital recommended uh, the capital stabilization fund and the general stabilization fund, putting money into both of those to the extent there's free cash available, and you all determine the amounts. That's basically where we wound up. I think I don't know the precise motion that we voted on, but so there's, there's, there's no yeah. point in even having this conversation until we get a free cash number and a um, snow and ice number, right? I mean, this is this conversation's irrelevant at this point. Well, only because I'm thinking though that to the extent we do have a free cash number and we need to propose an amount to go into a capital stabilization fund, you know, how much is capital looking to have in their stabilization fund um, just so we can be prepared for next week, but. So, so the, the comfort level is to get, if, if, the, if it was available for the capital stabilization fund, I think generally we all think 
200 grand is a nice number to kind of hold there. Okay. And we're at 166 or something, I think it was. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 166 and change. Yeah. So if we can bring that back up to 200, that would be nice. Yep. Okay. That's helpful. So public safety stabilization isn't in here. And is that just because we no longer need it since it's an annual 50% of ambulance? Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, BMR OPEB, we're crossing this one out at town meeting. Is that correct? We, oh we, no, or we need it still. because No, it's well, it's submitted by BMR and I do have to edit the uh, explanation in terms of the amounts. Um, so if for some reason the OPEB that's in the operating budget, the omnibus budget of our Article 6 somehow isn't approved, I don't know why it wouldn't be. It's the more legally preferable place for it to be is in our operating budget than in a warrant article item that was submitted by BMR. So assuming it, it, it passes, omnibus budget passes as including it, then this would be withdrawn. Okay. No action. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, BMR school committee stipends. I don't know if anyone has any questions on this. Um, this is an article we had also last year. In the past, we haven't we haven't had this on the warrant, but BMR has um, begun to include it because their budgeted their budget operating budget includes stipends to the school committee members. Um, those stipends need to be specifically approved by the town. So they have a specific article related to it. Um, I think you'll also see on our budget, BVT has a stipend. However, the BVT stipend is a separate line item in our in our approved operating budget, which is why they don't need their own article related to it. Um, but- um, Just a little backstory, if I could, Aubrey, though, just having worked with council on this and having dealt with BMR leadership to get this back in. This, I guess, was in there a few years back. It stopped being in there. Um, Blackstone has had it in their annual meeting warrant every year. And so the push was to get it back into Millville's. But technically, according to Millville's legal counsel, by virtue of approving the BMR operating budget that's in our omnibus budget, we effectively have done what this warrant article requires. So it's, in essence, redundant but it's not worth fighting over Right. That. Okay. Um, article 13 is not a financial article. Article 14 is consistent with, with what we've had at least last year um, related to funding of the PEG access and cable fund um, balance to include wages for the cable coordinator and part-time wages. Um, I think if we have any questions for that, we can certainly ask Tim that that's on the line, but I think this is consistent with what we've had last year as well. And this comes from the cable fund, right? So it's outside of our operating budget or our stabilization budget. Yeah, but technically what it does is provide the, it's really, it appropriates use of those funds to pay for, you know, Tim's on the payroll, like, you know, he's, but he's not in the operating budget. So his and Alex, uh, you know, Tim and Alex who are here this evening, or Tim's here. So to, to pay them legally appropriated, this does that. Gotcha. Okay. I, I could argue that, and I'm going to explore, that the COA pay issue using that grant might be something like this. It's not, you know, is it appropriated to, is it properly appropriated to pay that pay using those funds? It's not a big deal. It's worth, uh, one, you know, I, I'm going to ask the question, and that question came to my mind today. Okay. All right, and then we have Article 15. So Article 15 is the personnel article. Um, it looks like we have two, Article 15 and Article 16. One, one of the two would would be the would be passed at town meeting. Um, so. I know we've talked a lot about Article 15. Article 15 gives the Board of Selectmen the discretion with an, a process associated with it. So a hearing of, of sorts, but it gives the Board of Selectmen discretion to set wages for town personnel. Um, of course, you know, town meeting still approves a total budget line item, but the wage um, specifics related to hourly certain hourly employees 
um, and salaried employees are would be set by the board of selectmen exclusively. Um, and then the next article, which is kind of a second option, is an update to the personnel bylaw compensation plan, which is currently included in our bylaws, which I presume um, Peter and, and Jen uh, basically bring whatever is currently in our bylaws up to kind of today's standards associated with increases in minimum yeah, wage. Yeah, so really what this was done, we did have a compensation study done and there were two different sort of approaches. This approach is the simpler approach in terms of all it's really doing is taking the the last uh, one, two, like I think it's five years old or whatever mm -hmm. um, that's in the bylaws and updating them for the annual increases, to, including the FY23 increase. So that's really what's done there. The, the ones where there's employment contracts, that bylaw currently says that the it doesn't apply to anybody that has an employment contract anyway. So that's what right. we're looking for. And so question for um, Jen, I guess is to the extent the finance committee presumably are gonna vote on both of these since they have financial impact certainly. Um, to the extent we recommend one over the other, is that the one that you would be motioning at town meeting or you know, how are you expecting that this is going to um, procedurally work? Yeah, so I think if 15 passes, then we withdraw 16. That's what's going to be, that's what my thinking was. Peter, I don't know if you disagree with that. Yeah, I think, it, but this was one where uh, at special town meeting for various reasons, finance committee was zero and four or five, whatever it was on this one. So to the extent mm -hmm. that they're public hearing and they vote on this and they're not in favor, then I think Aubrey's questions, well, uh, you know, a good one to consider different than would you do something different as a board on 15 versus 16, knowing that the finance committee was in support of 15 or against 15? If they're against 15, you 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 might have a hard sell, that's all. Yeah, I think, um, I guess the only thing I would add to article 15 is um, like one of Andrew's concerns, for example, is that we could update the compensation kind of anytime, anytime we wanted. So it's an annual review. So it's sort of similar to 15 in that it's an annual review when we set salary. So we're not, you know, this week we hired this person at, you know, making this up $15 an hour. And then next week we hire the same person to do a similar job and they get $25 an hour. Like they're all, they're set annually. So we can't kind of play games like that. Um, but I guess I would, if you were not in favor of 15, I think I would still present it to the town and see what they thought. And if it failed, then then that's why we put in 16 as a backup. So 15 is a more modern approach um, in terms of hiring and things like that. And uh, as Peter mentioned, he hired a consultant to kind of look at how we're doing things. And so that's what the, how 15 came about. Um, but if it doesn't pass, we thought, you know, we should probably update that table because we're kind of stuck, you know, tied to it. So that's why we're like, well, we have plan A, plan B. I would prefer plan A, which is article 15, but if it doesn't pass, we have plan B, so. Hey, um, I'll just say, well, you know, I feel like I, I've said this before, I'm just gonna say it one more time and then I'll say it one more time next week and then <laughs> I'll just vote what we think. Um, my, my concern with article 15 continues to be that it requires it requires no feedback from the finance committee, which is actually not the primary concern of mine, but it is a concern of mine is that you have, you know, whichever number of board of selectmen members that happen to be at the table at the time with whichever town administrator that happens to be at the table at the time, um, making these decisions that are putting the town in a position where they, they are still going to approve a line item at the end of the year. Um, but what happens, and we've seen this happen in past generations what happens is we get into situations where we've already agreed these employees have come on board and we've already agreed to pay them a certain amount and then we get to town meeting and we have to tell the town look if you don't approve this then you just lost the guy that was onboarded and you know he's under a contract and like it becomes this scary situation so that's kind of the biggest concern that i have is that it it with the table we can discuss it we can purposely kind of come forward with it each year and we know what 
the we know what the parameters are going to be. And so we have to, it's a bylaw change. It impacts all future generations until the bylaw is changed at another point in time in the future. And based on, you know, the history of Millville, it concerns me um, because I feel like it doesn't have enough checks and balances in place. Okay. So how, I think that that's not unreasonable. Um, and I'm sorry that I don't remember you saying that before. Um, should we, so we can't do this now, but at the town meeting then, would you amend perhaps on the somewhere in here where at this annual approval, the finance committee is included and must also approve? Like we could, and Peter, I don't know how you feel about that, but that could be like add another, like it would be something, it, it, would, it would force us to meet more, which might not be bad, but that would be, I would be open to that. Yeah, I think that's a very uh, good idea. It's a simple addition to one of these clauses. Yeah. And that would be an amendment. So, yeah, I mean, if that's something that satisfies Aubrey's feelings and concerns, you know? Yeah, I think it, it helps me as a finance committee person. Um, you know, I won't put my, I won't, put my town's member hat on right now um based on you know past history with certain things but um you know certainly that at least forces a financial discussion related you know with the finance committee as to how does this impact if we pay this person this amount and here's what we have left and it just requires that other check of what do we have in the budget how many hours this person work like basic you know math and then just consideration down the road it, it would help me um, in thinking about this, but. Yeah, yeah. And just no, for sim simple sake, uh, you know, 21 purpose is town administrator shall develop and recommend a town personnel policy to be approved by the board of selectmen and administered by town administrator. And you just insert by the board of selectmen and, and finance, finance committee. Yeah. And you do that on town meeting floor. Yep. Yeah, I, Aubrey, so it's my, we have similar discussions on the board of selectmen because right now we're down to three again. And like we've talked about, should we ask townspeople if they want a board selection of three? But then I always think about like myself on the board selection with like the two people who hit me the most and like, hmm, how would that? So like, I understand what you're saying. Like if we have a finance committee that if the board selection is very different and the finance committee is different, like there should be, I, I totally know what you're saying. <laughs> and I'd add it to 20.3. There's another section where at the conclusion of the public hearing, the board of selectmen may accept, reject, or amend the proposal. And I just add, and finance committee. Finance committee. Yeah. Two places. Yeah. That helps. Okay. I think that helps. And then you're in the 20th century and <laughs> you're the 21st. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So we're right about nine o'clock here. Um, does anyone have anything else before we break and again we'll meet again on wednesday um at our public hearing but does anyone else have anything at this point go ahead Peter. i just want to point out that we're like we're likely to have on the board selectman agenda 516 some year-end transfers they'll relate to the things we've sort of known are coming one is uh townwide fuel um, the other one is at least tri valley um for uh tuitions uh, okay and, okay. Uh, and transportation um I'm not going to vent about the uh, BMR OPEB, but um, I view that as a very big financial challenge of the town that's being, has been and continues to be not paid its proper attention. So I, I but I'm not going to vent. But also, if I have one moment, I think it's worthwhile. I, meant, I, I mentioned at the last uh, selectman's meeting, or I think it was, that I've been in contact with the Attorney General's office regarding former town accountant Justin Cole, who was indicted after a grand jury, and I was a key witness for the prosecution uh, during that uh, grand jury. And so he uh, he was scheduled to be uh, uh, he's not going to trial, but he was scheduled to be uh, uh, convicted and uh, and uh, provided uh, some sort of punishment. And so he likely will go to jail as a plea bargain for some form of jail for some form of time. And so the attorney general, uh, the, the prosecutor, asked me if, if I wanted to add any 
uh, comment for the hearing um, on his, uh, you know, indictment. And so I, I, I wrote these words, which he's going to say at when he uh, comes up, which is going to be, I think, on May 4th. Uh, that he couldn't make the first go around. He was sick. So on May 4th, I guess they're going to do it again. And so my comment, <clears throat> I read it out at the Selectman's meeting, and I think it's worth reading out here in this group. Millville is a small town with limited resources. It has hardworking, honest taxpayers. If one could best describe the sentiment of folks in Millville upon learning of Justin Cole's criminal activities, it would be betrayal. Municipal management and accounting are complex enough. The former is dependent in large part on well-meaning volunteers in leadership roles, the latter on professionals like Mr. Cole. To take advantage of the situation as was done is disappointing and despicable. I am glad that justice is going to be served for the residents of Millville. And I signed it, Peter Cruz of Millville, town administrator. So there's some good news. Some justice is being served. Thanks, Peter. Okay. And one quick thing too. Sure. So G June 6th, which is the first board selectman meeting in June, um, Peter is going to invite the auditors to go through the report. So I don't know if we should make that a joint meeting with the finance committee as well. Yeah, that um, sounds good. You'll probably have better questions than I will have. <laughs> so I thought it might make sense. So I'll let that give you as much notice as, you, as I can. So June 6th. Great. We'll be there. All right, all, if there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn at 9.04 p.m.? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, all in favor, aye? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you, thank you.